Hello, I am so excited to welcome you all tonight to participate in this virtual event leading up to the 35th anniversary of the JET program in 2022. We have a lot of people joining tonight from all over, so if you're joining live, please let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. We've got a great event for you, exploring some of the interesting things that JET alumni have been doing over the long history of the JET program. We will delve into Japanese sake and beer, explore the mysterious spirits in Japanese folklore and how they find a place in Marvel Comics, hear how a film director was inspired by his JET experience to make a movie, and see how living in Japan can lead to art creations and new business ventures. We will explore Japanese culture and identity through JET alumni, both in Japan and here in the United States. As we get ready to hear all these interesting stories and see some cool video clips, like what a farm stay experience in Japan is like and the inside of an artist studio, let's take a moment to reflect on our JET experiences. Where were you on JET? Do you have any special memories? Let us know in the chat. I'd also like to take a moment and ask that if you enjoy this program, please donate or become a member of US Jet AA. Your support is incredibly important and allows us to serve the JET alumni community with events such as this one. Now, before we get on to all the fun stuff, I'm excited to introduce our opening speakers, representing many different stakeholders in the JET program and supporters of the JET alumni network. First up will be a welcome from Paige Cottingham Streeter, who is a JET in Mie from 1988 to 1999. She is the chair of the US Jet AA Board of Directors and the executive director of the Japan US Friendship Commission. Her remarks will be followed by Masashi Mizobuchi, spokesperson at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, DC, and Philip Rosskamp, a Kumamoto Jet alumnus who is the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs at the US Embassy in Tokyo. Then we will hear from our funders for this event, Mayumi Shimotori, executive director of Claire, New York, and Masaya Shimoyama, Director General of the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. Hello and welcome. I'm Paige Cottingham Streeter, founding board member and chair of the US JET Alumni Association. I'm so excited to welcome you to US JET AA's first ever virtual online celebration of the JET alumni community. US JET AA was established to support and engage JET alumni, and the network of 19 chapters across the United States. We are everywhere, working as educators, diplomats, filmmakers, brewers, healthcare providers, journalists, artists, entrepreneurs, and the list goes on. As alumni, we may pursue different career paths, but we have a shared experience of living and working in local Japanese communities. This shared experience motivates us to rally support for Japan when disaster strikes and inspires us to support grassroots exchanges. Events like this help us stay connected to Japan and each other. Four years ago, on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the JET program, US JET AA hosted the first all alumni event in Washington, DC. We are excited about hosting another reunion in Seattle next spring to celebrate the JET program's 35th anniversary. Please stay tuned. Before we begin the program, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank US Jet AA Executive Director, Mahia Simons Lane, and the planning committee who curated this wonderful online event. I'm looking forward to learning about Jet alumni experiences in Japan and the many ways Jet alumni are sharing their knowledge about Japan and Japanese culture with others. Each in our own way, we are citizen diplomats. We're strengthening the important ties between Japan and the United States. Please enjoy the rest of the program, and I hope to see you in Seattle next year. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Masashi Mizobuchi, the spokesperson of the Embassy of Japan. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this celebration of JET alumni. As we approach the 35th anniversary of the JET program, we would like to reflect on the bridge between the US and Japan, which JET has had and continues to have a fundamental role in building. JET participants open the eyes of their students and their sur surrounding community to the world. Likewise, JET participants' lives are enriched and their horizons expanded by working in Japan. Of course, this intercultural exchange doesn't end after JET participants' time on the program. 
they continue on as cultural ambassadors, carrying a bit of Japan in their hearts wherever they go. With over 35,800 JET alumni from the United States alone, it's apparent how valuable they are to the U.S.-Japan relations. How do JET alumni contribute to U.S.-Japan relations? The JET alumni who vol volunteers at Japanese events or who becomes a Japanese language teacher or who goes on to work in the Japan field. The JET alumni who shares their stories about their time in Japan, inspiring others to learn about Japan and travel there, contributes. Prominent examples of JET alumni are Richard May Jr., Consul General in Osaka, Andrew Lee, Consul General in Sapporo, and Paige Cuttingham Streeter, Executive Director, Japan US Friendship Commission. There are countless ways our JET alumni contribute to US-Japan relations, and to them, I say thank you. JET alumni are an essential bridge between Japan and the United States, and I hope that each of you will active cultural ambassadors no matter where life takes you. I hope that today, in celebration of JET, you all enjoy the presentations. Thank you. The JET alumni, JET staff, and others joining the program. Tokyo kara konnichiwa. My name is Philip Roskamp, and I'm the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs serving at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. And it's a pleasure to join you in the lead up to the 35th anniversary of the JET program. Now, I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas, and you can't get much further away from Japan than San Antonio. But when I was a kid, for some reason, I was keenly interested in Japanese culture, Japanese language, and even Japanese food. So that when I went off to undergrad for my foreign language studies, instead of picking German, French, or Spanish, which was much closer to home, I picked Japanese. And I was terrible at it. Let me tell you, I was a horrible Japanese student until my professor introduced me to a study abroad program in Hokkaido. And for two months, I got to live with an amazing homestay family in Hakodate, Japan, where I learned about the culture and learned to speak the language. Following undergraduate school, I wanted to get back to Japan and was looking for different avenues to do so and JET provided me that pathway. I served for two years as a CIR in the Kumamoto City Hall, and Kumamoto is sister city of my hometown of San Antonio, Texas. So during those two years, I got to experience work in a Japanese office, I got to learn about professional level Japanese, and it was my first time to be part of an international community, which I directly attribute to my ability to join the US State Department. My second assignment in the US State Department was in Okinawa, Japan at our consulate there. And I got that assignment thanks to my language abilities and experiences in Japan. At every assignment along the way during my almost 20 years with the State Department, I've been able to work with Japanese diplomats, whether it was on issues in the Pacific Islands or whether it was on the South China Sea or whether it was maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific. We've been able to accomplish a lot together. And finally, here I am serving in Tokyo, again, an opportunity that I attribute directly to my time working on the JET program. So here we are at a moment in time where the U.S.-Japan relationship has never been stronger. Our friendship is close-knit and tight. Our businesses are cooperating on cutting-edge technologies. And our governments are cooperating together like they never have before. And finally, the U.S.-Japan alliance has grown in leaps and bounds over the years. And we're working together not only for our mutual defense, but for regional and global peace. So it's a great time to be working on the U.S.-Japan relationship. And it's a great time to be part of the JET program. I think I can assure you, I hope, that there is life after JET. For those of you who are thinking about the JET program or who've done the JET program, I really urge you to consider you know, serving the United States overseas. There are lots of ways to do so, and the State Department is just one of them. But I think JETs make great representatives of America even after the JET program. So thank you for your attention and good luck for the event. Hello everyone. I'm Mayumi Shimotori, the Executive Director of the Clear New York Office. It is my great pleasure to be a part of this virtual event. This year marks the 35th year of the JET program with a cumulative total of about 75,000 participants from around the world. Over half of these have come from the United States. I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the JET participants who have contributed greatly to the enrichment of foreign language education, the encouragement of mutual understanding with other countries, and the promotion of regional internationalization throughout this 35-year history. 
it is a particularly great achievement to be able to do this, not only in large cities, but also in rural areas all over Japan. We are honored to provide a chance for a diverse range of students and residents to connect with the world and to connect the world with Japan. The alumni around the world have used their experiences to support the current and incoming participants, to share Japanese culture, and to serve as a bridge between Japan and other nations in different aspects of society. With the largest population of alumni in the world, the U.S. has always been a leader in these efforts and in providing examples of how the alumni have worked to strengthen their community and utilize their JET experience to build successful personal careers after leaving the program. Because of this, I'm looking forward to hearing about the experiences of the panelists who are participating today. If I may just add, from this year, Clear New York has started a webinar project to provide local governments in Japan with information about JET alumni who are working as bridges between Japan and the US in various fields. We would be grateful if you could help us with this project as well. I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to all of you again for your past contributions and look forward to your continued support in the future. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be with you today. On behalf of the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership, I would like to congratulate you on three things. Firstly, Congratulations on the first 35 successful years of the JET program. The alumni are active in many fields. I always have such a great time meeting former JETs because they have a unique experience living and working in various places in Japan, sometimes the places that are not even familiar with most Japanese. We cannot talk about grassroots relations between our two countries without thinking about the importance of the JET program. Next, congratulations to US JET AA for your continuous endeavor in networking JET related people. You have played a significant role in sharing the achievements of each JET. I'm very proud to say we, the Japan Foundation, have been a good supporter and partner since your establishment and will be for the future. Lastly, congratulations to everyone who has worked so hard to prepare for this event in this unusual situation. I wish for the continued success of the important program. Thank you all so much for your remarks about the JET program and the important role JET alumni play in strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan. Now, are you ready for some music? Turn up the volume and get ready to feel the beat of some taiko, followed by a visually stunning look inside Japan, provided by the US branch of Inside Japan Tours, whose branch director, Matthew Eccles, was a JET in Yamanashi from 2002 to 2005. Hey, my name is David Capera, and I'm standing here in Naraken's uh, Kawakami Mura. And this is the uh, same ground of the junior high school where I used to be an English teacher. Um, I was a JET from 2012 to 2014. So nine years ago, I began teaching at this school. And uh, two years ago, I moved back here from New York. And uh, the reason was to, you know, I, I always wanted to kind of return to this village and try to make an impact in a different way. And I felt that, uh, you know, these days, if you have internet, uh, you can get work anywhere. Uh, so that's what I've been trying to do with documentary film. But I uh, reconnected with the same group of people I used to play Taiko with. And uh, this, what we've been doing now, is promoting uh, the local uh, cedar that's made in this village. This is a lumberjack village, as you can tell from the background. And uh, this drum, uh, it's called OK Daiko. It's actually made out of uh, local cedar. So today, uh, I will play uh, this taiko with some members here in the gym uh, of the school where I used to teach English. Thank you.
Hello, I am Maureen Brace. I was a JET ALT in Nagasaki, Ken from 1994 to 96 and worked at a junior high, high school, and at the Nagasaki Ken Kyoiku Center. I got involved in Taiko because I loved the power, the sound which could be felt in my body and the movement. It's just so much fun. I'm always learning and it's an amazing connection to my culture and a memorable way to share Japanese culture with audiences of all ages. I formed Kokyo Taiko by chance. Um, I knew a professor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln who knew that I played Taiko well in Japan and she asked me to teach a few of her students to perform and play for a Japanese night. We had a very short time to get ready but it was just amazing and fun and we pulled it off and uh, we did it for the next few years and to satisfy our craving to play more and do more and perform more, um, we slowly bought each piece of equipment and made our own equipment and started receiving bookings by word of mouth and just seeing the demand for this type of performance and cultural art once we got going um, helped us to thrive and to get more and more bookings. And pre-COVID, we were seeing about 30 bookings a year. We've performed in four states for all types of venues, events, and people. And it really is a privilege and an honor to get to share what I love with people from all walks of life. And I thank the JET program for giving me that start in learning about my Japanese heritage and making a connection and bond with my family in Japan and my friends, my coworkers, my students, and for the chance of a lifetime playing taiko. Thank you. Tokyo Taiko! Performing Yashawaka, a fighting song. <laughs> I just wanted to talk a little bit about the different types of Buddhism there are in Japan. Zen, of course, being one of them. Zen uh, literally means meditation. This is a mantra. In my career here in Japan, you name it, I've bought it out of a vending machine. I have bought 
hot dogs. I bought C batteries. I once bought a cassette tape. I once bought an entire suit. So really, you name it, it's in a vending machine somewhere. Everything you need is located in this capsule. There are plenty of things you can do when you come to a shrine in Japan. And one of them is to go and pray. Another one is to go and get a omamori, which is a lucky charm. This one is kōtsu anzen, health and safety when you're driving. Wow, those segments really gave me a Natsukashi feeling. So get ready to learn about the basics of sake in six minutes. Sake is one of the most recognizable cultural exports from Japan, but if you're like me and don't know much about sake other than how to drink it, I'm sure you'll learn a lot from sake expert John Gautner. And if you're at home right now and have some sake on hand, why not pour a glass and enjoy it while listening to John? Greetings to everyone. My name is John Gautner, and I was a jet in Kanagawa from 1988 until 1990. Today, I want to give a very, very brief presentation on sake. It's basically the least you need to know about sake. What I hope to do is to give everyone enough information to make it dangerous to yourself. In other words, to give you just enough information to make you more interested in sake so that you go out and buy some and try some. Uh, and if you already drink a lot of sake, that you go out and drink a little bit more. Because the most important thing you can do if you want to learn about sake is to taste as wide a range of sake as possible. And with that as the objective, the place to begin with is, what is it? What is this stuff that we call sake? And in short, it's an alcoholic beverage that's brewed, and it's brewed from rice and rice alone. Uh, in other words, it's actually made closer to the way that a beer is made than it is to anything else. However, one thing that makes sake unique in the entire world of alcoholic beverages is the use of koji. Koji is rice upon which a mold, and that mold is known as Aspergillus oryzae, has been propagated. That mold gives off enzymes that give you starch to sugar conversion and allow the rice to be fermented. So sake is an alcoholic beverage that's brewed from rice alone and makes use of koji. The alcohol content is about 16%. It could be anywhere from 14 to 18, but typically it's about 16%. So it's just a few percentage more than a robust red wine. There are nine grades of sake, eight of which are premium, although it really depends on how you count them. The most visible difference between the various grades of sake is the rice, how much you've milled the rice before you begin to brew. Milling the rice is important because sake rice in particular has starch in the center, which we want, and fat and protein on the outside, which we don't want. So more milling removes more of the fat and protein and gives you a cleaner, more delicate, more refined final sake. So basically, the more you mill the rice, the higher the grade will be, at least legally speaking. I do want to rush to point out that more milling is not necessarily better. It just leads to a more refined, more expensive, more delicate sake, although higher milling rates do get all the attention. As I mentioned earlier, there are a handful of grades of sake, and the grades that are made with the most highly milled rice are known as ginjo, and ginjo has several subclasses to it, dai ginjo, junmai dai ginjo, junmai ginjo, and regular ginjo. And basically, ginjo technically constitutes about the top 15% of the industry. And again, most of it's going to be very refined, very delicate, and often very aromatic. It's not necessarily the only thing you're going to want to drink, but it does get all the attention. Another term that you might want to remember about the grades of sake is the word junmai. Junmai refers to sake that was made without using the addition of brewer's alcohol, which is a very, very important aspect of the sake world. But when the junmai word is included in the grade of the sake, you probably can, can expect a slightly richer, fuller, more umami-laden sake. Uh, in terms of what temperature to enjoy a sake, most of the premium grades, most of the most expensive sake in the market, is probably best enjoyed slightly chilled. Why is that? simply because the flavors and aromas that the brewer worked so hard to exude will be best enjoyed at slightly chill temperatures. However, there's plenty of wonderful exceptions, and I highly encourage you to experiment with temperature once you feel comfortable doing so. To me, one of the most useful things about sake is this. 90% of the time, sake is fairly priced. Not 100% of the time, but 90% of the time. What's great about this is you can walk into a store or look at a menu, and you don't have to know anything about the grades or the regions or the brand names or anything, and you can make a decision based on price, and 90% of the time, you'll be happy with what you've purchased. So use that rule as much as possible, but just remember that there's a lot of exceptions. 
most of the more expensive sake in the market will indeed be a bit more aromatic and a bit more light and a bit more delicate and a bit more refined. If you like sake like that, you're golden. If not, you might want to consider breaking that rule and look for less expensive sake as it may suit your palate a bit more. So yeah, sake is fairly priced, but remember, personal preferences will override that rule quite often. A few more things about sake. It's been around for about 1,700 years. However, in the form that we know it today, it's been around for about 1,000 years. Currently, there's about 1,160 brewers that are active on the market. This number has been dropping. When I got to Japan in 1988, there were 2,500, so it's already been halved. Sake consumption peaked in 1973, and it's basically been dropping ever since. However, lately we've seen a shift towards premium uh, that seems to be gathering some traction. So the industry is definitely in flux, but it is moving toward premium, although it is still contracting. COVID obviously has taken a huge toll on the sake industry. But interestingly, those producers that make a lot of inexpensive sake, sake that's bought and brought home and enjoyed there, aren't doing nearly as badly as the brewers that make mostly Junmaishi or Ginjo or premium sake that's enjoyed in restaurants for obvious reasons. The effects of COVID have also affected the rice growing industry because orders for sake rice have dropped off quite a bit. And the brewing industry isn't sure how easy it will be to convince rice growers to move back to the harder to grow sake rice varieties in the future. So we have to see how that unfolds. What are the largest sake producing regions in Japan? The largest is Hyogo Prefecture, within which sits a neighborhood called Nada, that's half in Kobe and half in Nishinomiya. Second largest is Kyoto, centered in the Fushimi Ward of the city of Kyoto. The third largest brewing region is Niigata Prefecture. Also, the most popular region these days is certainly the Tohoku region, in particular Fukushima Prefecture, but the other five prefectures of Tohoku are also quite popular as well. As for popular brands, I'm going to have to leave that to you. I actually export about 16 brands of sake, so even with that full disclosure, it's very, very difficult for me to tell you what to drink. Also, I don't know where you are, but there's good sake available all over the world, and I highly encourage you to try as many different varieties as you can to find out what it is that you like. But really, there's just so many wonderful brands of sake out there. And discovering which ones you like and finding new ones that you like all the time is part of the joy of the sake journey. So hopefully this short presentation was helpful enough to enable you to get out and try more sake and enjoy it. Kampai. Thank you so much, John. I really learned a lot. Coming up, these next two segments really illustrate how jets become strong cultural bridges between Japan and the US. First up is director Aaron Woolfolk, who will join us in conversation with Jim Gannon to share how his film career and jet connected, leading him to create the movie, The Harry Maya Bridge. Today, I'm here with the award-winning filmmaker, Aaron Wolfolk, one of the few Americans to direct a feature film in Japan. Um, to be honest, Aaron, I'm about the farthest from an expert you can get on film, but we do have <laughs> something in common. You were a jet program teacher in Kochi Prefecture from 1991 to 1993. Yeah, 1992 I, to 1993. 1992 to 1993. I was a jet just to the north of you in Shikoku and Ehime Prefecture at the same time from 1992 to 1994. And in fact, we used to make a food pilgrimage two or three times each year over the mountain range to Kochi to eat katsu tataki. So I'm fully aware of just how remote and rural Kochi is, which is about yeah. as rural as you get in Japan. Yeah. How did you end up there? I applied for JET and I didn't really know much about Japan. You know, that was before the internet, before you, before you can do your research and stuff. So I just did probably what, 85, 90% of JET applicants did. I asked for Tokyo and I asked for Osaka. And of course I didn't get it. And I was sent to Kochi Prefecture, which I had no idea where that was. And so it was just kind of a random thing where that's where I happened to be placed um, when I went on JET. But it totally, completely just fit. I totally loved the place. And it was, I was kind of nervous when I first went there because, you know, I was born and raised in Oakland, California, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So a big metropolitan area. And here I am being sent to this rural, rural place in, on this remote, in this remote part of Japan. And I was kind of nervous about that at first, but I really fell in love with it. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the rural, the rural culture. And, and it was, it was wonderful. 
Did you have an interest in Japan before? Have you been studying Japanese language? What, what brought you there? Even before I, I had any idea I was going to apply for the JET program, even, even before I heard of the JET program, I was into Japanese film. I thought, you know, it was just a really interesting window of this completely different society. And yet I watched these films that kind of kind of emphasize the common humanity we all share. So you'd see these you'd see these stories taking place in this completely foreign culture, but you can completely identify with the characters because I felt that way. I've been through I've been through that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I I I I came to get an appreciation and admiration of Japan through cinema. You know, I understand that you go back almost every year now to Kochi. At least one, sometimes two or three times a year. You know, it depends. You know, I at least go there. You know, I go there at least for pleasure. You know, I'm also working on some projects, so I go back there for that. But I've gone back to Japan nearly every year since I left. You know, COVID has totally upended that. But Okay, and so, so I was going back to Japan and going back to, to Kochi, to Sasaki, seeing my friends, hanging out. And I started to think, you know, well, you know, I want to be a filmmaker. So I wonder if I could do something with Japan, if I, could, if I could use my experiences in Japan and make films here. And then I was, but then I thought, okay, who's going to, you know, how many foreigners make movies in Japan under the Japanese system. Nobody, you know? So how am I gonna make that happen? And then I thought, okay, I know what I, okay. I know what I'm gonna do for my thesis project in film school. I am going to shoot a short film in Japan, in Kochi to show that it could be done, to show that I could do it. And I actually ended up shooting two because I figured, well, okay, if you're going to go all the way from New York City to Japan to shoot a film, why not shoot two short films? So collectively, I made these two short films as my thesis, pro as my thesis project in film school that are a prequel to the Harimaya Bridge that are about the character Mickey, who was deceased in the Harimaya Bridge. This is a good lead in because I really want to ask you about the Harimaya Bridge, which was, if I'm correct, this year, 2009 um, yes. movie. It was your debut as a director and as a writer for a feature film. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, this starred Ben Guillory and Dan Glover, as well as Saki Takuoka and Misa Shimizu, correct? Yes, yes. Could you tell us a little bit about the storyline? Yeah, the Harimaya Bridge is about a father in the United States, San Francisco, who is mourning his estranged son. His son died, his son has just died in a tragic traffic accident in Japan. And the father and son were estranged because the son wanted to go off and teach in Japan. And the father, he had lost his own father in the war, World War II, in the Pacific Theater. So he, def he has complicated feelings about Japan. And here's his son wanting to go off to Japan to teach English. And so they became estranged. And then the son dies before they can make up. And the son and the father is distraught. The son was an artist and the son did a lot of paintings while he was in Japan. So the father decides he wants to, he wants to go to Japan to retrieve his son's painting because he feels that like he should have them. So he goes to Japan and he doesn't really want to get to know the people there. He doesn't really want to know, get to know the country. He's, he's on this mission to get his son's paintings back. And he connects with the people in the education office that his son worked with, the county education office. And they, and they help him out and they take him around, even though he doesn't really want their help. He doesn't want to, he doesn't really want to be around many Japanese people. So this, the movie is basically about his experience in Japan, how he comes to terms with his son's death, how he rediscovers his son through his son's life in Japan, and how he comes to terms with his, with his own father's death. And, and, the, and the effect and impact that being in Japan has on him. Wonderful. And now let's see a clip from the Harimaya Bridge. I don't know what to do with myself, man. Hello. 
lost him. He loved his father very much. I'm going to go over there and do whatever I have to do to get my son's art back. If I have to smile and be nice, I'll smile and be nice. My son's dream is alive in this country. That was fascinating. Were there any challenges as a, as a foreigner, as an American, as an African-American operating in that environment? If I'm on a set in the United States, you know, so I'm talking to people, I'm talking to people, do this, do that. Okay. People are talking to me, but they're also like, you know, 20 other conversations that, that are going on around you and you can hear those conversations. So you kind of, so you know, what's going on, you, you know, what's going on. Okay. But if you're like me on a Japanese set and your Japanese is not at the fluent level. So, you know, I might be able to, to have a simple conversation with people, but there are all these conversations that are going on, that are going around and it's going so fast. I can't pick up on that. So that was a real challenge for me. That was a really interesting challenge for me. And I had to develop other muscles as a director to get around that. And then also, you know, I think when you're doing business, when you're being professional, if you're not fluent, you shouldn't try to do that. You know, you should use a translator basically, you know? So I had, I had an assistant director because, you know, when an actor has a concern, when, when a director of photography has a concern, you don't want to be struggling with the language. You want to want to deal with that. So, so I had a translator who was one of the assistant directors who would help me with those things, you know, but just the fact that there's all this Japanese going around my head and I'm not able to grasp it, you know, for me, that was a challenge, an interesting challenge, you know, um, but yeah, so I had to, I had to develop different muscles to have to deal with that. You know, I'm feeling a little old, but this was 30 years ago, our first yes. with Japan. And yet you're still looking to be filming in Japan and you still have this connection and these, these stories about life that you want to tell through that connection. Yeah. Well, you know, I tell people that the jet program changed my life, you know, Japan changed my life. It's not, it's not that it made me do something completely different than I was going to do. You know, I always wanted to be a storyteller. I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I was always going to do that, but you know, having the jet experience living in Japan, it totally changed my outlook on life. You know, it made me, you know, it, it made me feel like it kind of feels small to say I'm an American citizen. I feel more like I'm a citizen of the world. You know, the jet program, the Japan experience gave me that perspective. And so the stories I want to tell, they're not just relegated to here here in the US, you know, they're, they're international stories I want to tell. And I got that from my jet experience and from just being involved in Japan for the last 30 years. And you're right, it's, you know, not, well, we're not that old yet. It's more like 28, 29 years, I think. But isn't it fascinating for us to, just to see the changes that have, that, that have happened with Japan and with the jet program? With the jet program in that, you know, in that time. When I went on jet, there were like, there were 31 you know, total jets in Kochi. You know, there were 29 ALTs and there were two CIRs, you know. Mm -hmm. Today, there are like about 150 jets, 130, 150 jets in Kochi. And it's just such a different experience, you know, and it's evolved, you know, seeing how the jet program has evolved has just been so fascinating for me. And, and I'm sure for you too. Aaron, I, this has been fascinating talking with you. I think all of us are looking forward to your next story, whether it's gonna be on the page or on, on the screen. Um, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for your interest and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm always happy to participate in, in JET events and, and to connect with, 
with my fellow JET alumni, you know, my, my JET family. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron and Jim. It's incredible how JET had such a powerful influence on Aaron's career. Now, let's hear about something a little spooky, yokai. These mischievous or malevolent spirits are well-known in Japan, but would you ever imagine them in a Marvel comic? Zach Davison will tell us more. Hey there, my name is Zach Davison. I'm a writer, a translator, and a lecturer, and I focus on Japanese folklore, on yokai, on yure, um, and all of the spooky, spooky, ghosty parts of Japan. I've written my own books, such as Yure, the Japanese Ghost, Kaibyo, the Supernatural Cats of Japan, and Yokai Stories. I've translated a lot of classic comic works, including a lot of the works of um, Shigeru Mizuki, such as his Eisner Award-winning Showa History of Japan, as well as his famous folklore series, Gegere no Kitaro. I've also translated works such as Leiji Matsumoto's Captain Harlock, Go Nagai's Devilman, and quite a lot of classic works. Uh, that's some of one of my specialty as well as where my passion is. And recently, I've been working for Marvel Comics, and I've been working for Marvel Comics with a friend of mine, Peach Momoko, on a comic series called Demon Days. And one of the things that we've been doing is bringing Japanese yokai and making them an official part of the Marvel Universe. And that has been a lot of fun, and it's something that I'm going to tell you all about. I was a jet. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. There, at the beginning, of course, I was a jet, or else I wouldn't be here, right? Um, I was a jet in both Nara and Osaka, so I was a jet for five years. First, I started in Nara, and that was from 2001 to 2004. After that, I transferred over to Osaka for an additional two years, where I worked as the regional advisor um, living up in Ikeda. And actually, I got so much out of JET. I can honestly say that my life changed because of JET. You know, I went to JET. I'd never been to Japan before. I really didn't speak a lot of English or really didn't speak any Japanese besides basic introductions. Um, but what I got there not only was a love of the Japanese language, but also was just a love of Japanese monsters as well as Japanese folklore. You know, when I was there, especially in Nara and I arrived during Obon, you could just see that there was there was just magic everywhere. And there was so much that I didn't understand. But I wanted to know about it. So I I just studied it and researched it as much as possible. I was just ravenous for information on everything that I was seeing around me. And my local jet chapter also had a newsletter called the Yamato. And so I started to write about everything that I'd researched for the Yamato because I figured if I found it interesting, other people would find it interesting too. And writing for the Yamato on Jet is really what started my career towards being what I am now, which is a professional writer. I found that I enjoyed writing. I found that I enjoyed writing on folklore. And I found that people enjoyed reading what I wrote. My career has taken me a lot of different places since then. Uh, through the translation of Shigeru Mizuki's work, I evolved to other working in comics. I worked for a few series for Image Comics on Wayward uh, with the friends of mine, Jim Zub and Steve Cummings. And that road has eventually led me to Marvel, where I work now with Peach Momoko. And it's been a lot of fun. So the basic premise of Demon Days is a rethinking of the Marvel comics world, which even if you're not a comics reader now, I'm sure you're familiar with, right? You've seen the movies, you've seen the Avengers, you've seen the X-Men, you've seen the Wolverine, you know, Wolverine and things like that. Now imagine that world, but instead of mutants, all of those X-Men are yokai. And that's the basic premise of Demon World. It's a complete reinvention of these Marvel characters. And we've done some cool analogous stuff. So for example, the X-Men Nightcrawler is the Al Bozu. The, uh, Villain Mystique is a Bake Karasu. Uh, we have Wolverine in there as a shape shifting wolf as well. We have, um, you know, tried to find as many analogies as we could between this type of mutant and specifically this type of yokai. And I write these pieces in the back, and Peach does these um, pieces of artwork for them called yokai files that are basically there to teach. The same thing that I've been talking about for a long time, but now to just a much vaster audience of people. And so Demon Days, I'm able to keep this love of Japanese folklore that I learned when I first landed on the ground in Jet and experienced my first Obon in Narakoen, seeing these lanterns everywhere and wondering what this magic and mystery was. And now I'm able to share that through the format of comics in a way that I think I have never been able to before. 
my eventual goal and my stated goal for a long time has been to get the word yokai as an official part of the English language. And so if and when it appears as a new word in the dictionary, you'll know that my work is done. Um, until then, that's my time. Thank you all very much. It's been great to talk to you. I love being a Jet. I love sharing my love as, for be, as being a Jet. And I am so thankful for everything that the Jet program has brought me. So uh, have a great day. And it has been great to see you. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Zach. Such a clever concept to reimagine X-Men as yokai. Actually, I thought this was so cool when I watched this pre-submitted segment that I immediately ordered Demon Days. I can't wait to read it. Now, next up, we have something a little bit different. Many JET alums do research of all different types. Jets in academia gain expertise on all sorts of different topics from Japanese hip hop to gift giving practices to Buddhism in Japan. So we've invited Jane Yamashiro to join us tonight to talk about the research she's done on the Japanese American experience in Japan. Hi, my name's Jane Yamashiro and I was a CIR in Nagano Prefecture, Iyama City from 1995 to 1998. Today, I'd like to tell you um, about my book um, called Redefining Japaneseness, Japanese Americans in the Ancestral Homeland. It was published in 2017 and uh, comes from research that I conducted for five years in Japan and then several years after that in the United States, interviewing Japanese Americans living in Japan and uh, who had lived in Japan and returned to the United States. I'm gonna focus on one finding in particular that uh, looks at Japanese Americans who are phenotypically similar to most Japanese in Japan. So to be clear, I did interview Japanese Americans who were multiracial and multi-ethnic, um, but uh, I talk about them in a different part of the book. So um, today I'll just focus on these Japanese Americans who look similar to most Japanese. So when these Japanese Americans first go to Japan, many comment on how unusual it is um, for them to blend in in Japan, how it makes them feel um, accepted, it makes them feel anonymous, like they just fit in. Um, for many people who grew up in areas of the United States where they were um, not part of the racial majority, then um, it's the, the first time for them to feel this kind of um, invisibility. Um, however, once they start speaking with and interacting with people in Japan, then uh, they become miscategorized or misinterpreted as Asian immigrants. This is because they'll be um, speaking in Japanese and it's accented Japanese, they have limited vocabularies, and because they look phenotypically Asian, then um, people assume that they must just be immigrants from China or Korea or the Philippines. So as a way to um, correct that, um, my interviewees would let people know that they were from the United States. Um, this then um, would result in them oftentimes being treated better. And so once they noticed this, it motivated them to, um, to keep uh, letting people know that they were from the United States, being more proactive about it. And um, then um, what would happen after that is when um, these phenotypically similar to Japanese people looking um, Americans would let people know that they're from the United States. Um, it would confuse people because um, the common response they would get is, well, how can you be American when you look Japanese? Or are you half or hafu? Because if you're Japanese and American, and American means white, then you must be something else in addition to um, American. Um, so then this would result in them needing to explain their family histories, 
Um, the fact that they were ethnically Japanese, that their ancestors came from Japan, and they were raised in the United States, and, and just sort of explaining that. So I argue in the book, I show how uh, through living in Japan, through interacting with people in Japan, these Japanese Americans reconstruct identities as Japanese Americans. And this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that most research um, on migration, international migration, shows how um, international migration leads to the strengthening of national identities. So this is, would be true for white Americans. When you go to Japan, then you're gonna feel very American. But I'm finding that for a racial minority, then when they say they're American, then this racial minority gets reconstructed as part of that Americanness because people are like, but you don't look American. Um, the other thing that this tells us is that there's this hierarchy of foreigners in Japan and Japanese Americans through being categorized in these different ways, um, we can see this hierarchy of foreigners, um, part of it at least. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jane. That was really interesting. I hope I have a chance to read your book. For our next segment, I had the pleasure of visiting artist Laura Lukachevsky in her studio and learning about how she integrates Japanese motifs into her art. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Laura Lukashevsky, and my studio is White Point Studio here in Mount Rainier, Maryland. I work primarily with clay. Um, I do ceramic installations, and during COVID, I've actually started focusing a lot on pottery, so I've been doing a lot of pottery over the past year and a half. In undergraduate school, I started studying Japanese language and politics and Buddhism and became very interested in Japan. I'd never been there, um, but was really fascinated by the history. And it was during one of my Japanese politics class when a professor mentioned the JET program um, that the embassy was doing, and it was in its third year. And he suggested that if we were interested, we should contact the embassy. So I went on JET for two years. Um, I was in the town of Minami Tanecho on Tanegashima in Kagoshima Prefecture. Um, stayed there for two years, came back and decided to go to graduate school and my master's in Asian studies with a focus on Japan. And then I continued on with my interest in Japan, working for the Japan America Societies in Seattle and in Washington, DC, while doing pottery and art on the side. And then in 2005, I decided to leave that world behind and focus on my art full time. And I, that's what I've been doing pretty much since then. Artists draw on their personal experiences to create and inspire their artwork. And I think that for me, a lot of my experiences in Japan, both from just my actual physical experiences, but also from what I studied and um, sort of my love of seeing Japanese architecture, Japanese gardens, the beautiful countryside, um, especially rural Japan. In my free time, I also scuba dive and I spend a lot of time in the garden. And so all of these things come together to inform the different types of work that I do in the studio. Um, I will say that during COVID, I have had a lifelong love of um, blue and white pottery and indigo dyeing and Japanese textiles and Japanese washi paper. I wanted to find sort of a way to bring my two interests together. And with the pottery, I think that it gave me an opportunity to sort of reflect on sort of the tradition of blue and white pottery, but bring into it my own personal um, sort of iconography and mix, um, while also echoing some of the, the different graphic things that I like from, um, you know, just the waves and chrysanthemums and things like that and cherry blossoms. To me, there's something really, you know, special about the cherry blossoms and this idea of mono no aware and the poignancy, you know, finding beauty and loss. And that's something that resonates with my artwork, whether it's something really um, direct, like a cherry blossom motif or something more indirect when it's like an installation that's only temporary, um, that will only exist, you know, for a moment in time. But to me, that's such a powerful 
I guess, element of being a human being that I think Japan has done a really good job of encompassing and explaining and celebrating in their culture that as an American, we don't necessarily highlight that aspect of being a human being, but it's something that as all humans, we feel it. And so I love, you know, trying to find this bridge between the two cultures and trying to, um, I don't know, elevate some of my work just by take examining those different ideas that I think that I feel, but, you know, as an American, we don't have words for, but Japanese culture does. And so it's a really interesting um, juxtaposition of the two and trying to create a bridge. And also, you know, from my long um, career working in U.S.-Japan relations, I, you know, most of my work at Japan America Society was to, to promote understanding between the two cultures. So I really love being able to do that through my artwork and talking to people that don't necessarily have an experience with Japan, you know, giving them a bridge and sort of a, an opening for them to explore more directly. Thank you, Laurel. I am always blown away by seeing the details of Laurel's art. I actually have a few of her pieces of my own. One of them, this little kitty with a sakura and a unicorn horn, and the sake cup, which I really wish I had been drinking sake out of during John Gottner's uh, section of the event tonight. You know, hearing and seeing Laurel's art really showcases that there are opportunities to make cultural bridges and everything. Next, let's hear from Kay Makishi, who will talk about just how beneficial the JET program is for the JETs themselves and how the JET experience can provide a wealth of useful professional and life skills. Hi, my name is Kay Makishi, and I served as a CIR in Okagakimachi, Fukuoka from 2011 to 2014. And I also served as chair for National AJAC between 2013 to 2014. As a Japanese American with both of my parents from uh, being from Okinawa, Japan, yet myself being born and raised in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, AKA Amish County, Pennsylvania, the JET program was one of the best opportunities for me to go back to Japan and learn about the Japanese culture in a more intimate way. Um, instead of being a student, for example, I was able to experience it as a shakaiji, as an adult, and also pick up and learn a lot of soft skills and hard skills. The soft skills being understanding the Japanese culture from a perspective of working at a local government office, and the hard skills, for example, nemawashi, right? When you're trying to propose something, get something approved and push through uh, to be able to execute your ideas on various projects. And so that very much applies to what I do today. Today, I am an independent consultant for venture and corporate backed startups based in New York City. Um, but just to kind of take a step back about what I did after JET and how that has influenced greatly what I do today, uh, right after the JET program, I served as a volunteer for Peace Boat for three months as a communications coordinator. After that, I did my master's at Oxford University. Um, after my master's, I received funding from the European Union Entrepreneurs Program to help consult small businesses in Europe to expand in US and Japan. So obviously that is very much right up the alley. My jet skills were directly applicable to that position in terms of the language skills, the culture skills, and being able to sell to a Japanese market because I know the culture and understand the culture. After um, my, uh, my stint in Europe, I then started my own fashion company and that was heavily influenced by my Okinawan heritage. Due to COVID, I paused that briefly. Um, still, you know, a big dream of mine, uh, perhaps later on. But that's something that I'm passionate about is how to basically spread, uh, you know, my traditional Okinawan roots and heritage, the beautiful messages and meaning behind it throughout the world. Um, and that brings us to today, where I, again, am consulting for various companies. And one of my clients being one of the top Japanese trading companies or Sogo Shoshas in helping them develop a Japanese beauty skincare marketplace here in the US. 
So it's the first time this large company is taking on this venture. Um, and I'm combining my skill set of digital marketing, um, which I had prior to joining Jet, and combining that with my Jet experience, the Japanese cultural understanding, um, and being able to really help this company develop something totally new in the U.S. marketplace. Obviously, as an American, I understand the U.S. marketplace well. And so it's a really nice blend of being able to connect all these dots. Um, if you are a Jet currently, or if you just recently graduate or finish your JET program, some a lot of these dots, most of the time will not connect, I feel like, when you're in that moment. It's only after the fact um, where you're able to look back 2020, you know, have that 2020, um, you know, hindsight and that insight of, oh, hey, yeah, so that led to this. And then this opportunity led to that. Um, and one of the biggest threads in my life as a you know student all the way to as a professional now has been Japan. Japan has been a huge part of my life, again, personally and professionally. And I feel like JET really helped lay that foundation for then me to be able to do what I am doing today. So I am very grateful for the JET program and all these sponsors and supporters of it. And I hope that it continues to flourish and we continue to develop the next generation of JET alumni that are out there as essentially citizen diplomats and being able to share the culture of Japan through these one-on-one -on -one connections, whether that's personally or professionally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kay. Well, we already heard about sake, but now let's go to an interview between Beer Sommelier Mario Depen and two of the three JETs who founded the Kyoto Brewing Company. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario, and I will be facilitating today's conversation with Chris um, and Paul, uh, both JET alumni and founders of the Kyoto Brewing Company. Uh, I myself, I'm a Ciceron, which uh, means beer sommelier. Um, and its most basic form, Ciceron is a guide. Uh, but in the context of beer, it's someone with, it's defined as someone with demonstrated their expertise who guides consumers to enjoyable and high quality experiences with beer. So we're excited today with share, to share more about ourselves and our respective um, experiences and the exciting world of Japanese craft beer. So maybe we can start with a Kanpai since we're talking about beer. <laughs> okay, so Kanpai. 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 <laughs> Jumping right in, could you tell us about um, your journey from JET alumni, uh, so not JET alumni, from JET instructors to um, entrepreneurs? Um, and I would say touching on sort of the challenges maybe you faced and even opportunities enjoyed, especially as a foreigner um, navigating, you know, like kind of like the Japanese business world. Basically, after university, landed in Aomori, and then we were just kind of told the mantra, every situation is different. And kind of embracing that for not only JET program, but I guess you could say our journey after JET program as well. Um, after two years in Aomori, uh, I kind of wanted to go back to, uh, well, go down to Tokyo and get a job. And so at the JET Returners Conference, uh, I basically met a gentleman who was pitching his company. And the idea was to become a headhunter for uh, IT finance. This was before Lehman Shock. Uh, it was a lot easier back then to get into finance. And so with a little bit of gumption and some cert certificates in hand, um, I was basically able to get a job at Morgan Stanley supporting traders on the equity trading floor. Um, did that for a little bit of time. And uh, Chris was uh, studying Japanese down in Yokohama. And uh, <clears throat> I saw how quickly his Japanese had improved and really wanted to kind of join that bandwagon because at Morgan Stanley, I wasn't doing anything. Uh, Japanese related. So I quit my job, got a scholarship there, thankfully. Um, and then basically for 10 months, uh, got into this super intensive program. Um, that got cut short, unfortunately, because of the crazy earthquake. Um, so after the earthquake, uh, I had to find a job again. And uh, because of the experience um, at the Yokohama Japanese Center, uh, I was able to get a job in uh, high frequency trading at Nomura. Ironically, didn't speak Japanese again. Um, <laughs> luckily, uh, on the weekends, I was doing an MBA. Um, and I learned basically during that time how to start a company. 
And uh, Chris at the time had moved from Yokohama to Kyoto. And so uh, Chris started to get more and more into making beer in his apartment and it was taking over his life. And uh, Chris would be sending us his beers uh, and they were really good. And we saw what was kind of happening in the US with the craft beer industry and how things were taking off. Um, Chris was looking to want to do something at the time. I wanted to kind of pivot as well. And so um, I guess you could say with serendipity, we had a meeting at a cafe and uh, basically I said, I want to start a company. And Chris said, I want to start a company. And so that's how KBC uh, basically came about. <clears throat> um, from there, a lot of uh, visits to the US to go to a bunch of different breweries along the West Coast. Um, that was kind of the genesis point for starting our, our, uh, our business plan. And uh, after getting the business plan together, um, we basically raised a million US and with that million US, we then poured it into the company. And then here we are six years later. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the journey, I guess you could say in a nutshell. I, one, one thing I'm wondering, like, as I'm hearing you talk about, you know, the different stages you went through to, to get to where you are today, um, did, did you feel that, did, did you face any, like, I don't know, major challenges that you, you think some people would want to be aware of, you know, as, uh, I, I guess as a jet, from being an, an English instructor to becoming an entrepreneur, like what was, what would you say is the big, was the biggest challenge that you think others want to be aware of? Well, I guess uh, raising the million dollars was quite tough. Um, luckily, because we were doing craft beer and we're not doing something like IT, um, we could kind of rely on a segment called FFF, uh, Family, Friends and Fools is kind of what they called it in business school. So we were pitching to like, for example, my boss, uh, my boss's boss over at Nomura, we were pitching to our circle of friends. Um, and then we were also pitching to, like in Chris's case, his grandmother. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we now have 33 investors in total, but we probably had to pitch to close to 100 people. And so <clears throat> I guess you could say, um, yeah, you have to be flexible on who you want to try to get to get that money. But then at the same time, you kind of have to balance that with, you know, if you have a guy who wants to put in like $300,000, but then you have another person who wants to put in $10,000, um, there's going to be different expectations from both of those people. Um, so that's kind of been interesting to also figure out as we've gotten the brewery off the ground uh, and we're soon coming to the 10 year anniversary of KBC and uh, basically the expectations of those investors with our exit strategy. Yeah, I'd say in addition to that as well, one thing <clears throat> that's uh, been really important for us and it's been in interesting to see how mo much more important it's gotten um, over time is just having that really strong vision of what you want to accomplish. I think uh, we had that at the beginning uh, to a certain degree. Uh, you know, we learned a lot along the way, but uh, without that strong vision and commitment to what you want to do, uh, there's so many hurdles that pop up. It's so easy just to say, you know what, forget it. Uh, it's not worth it. Um, but if you really have that, that drive and desire, not only to get the company off the ground, but for example, COVID-19 uh, threw us a pretty big curveball uh, here at the company. But thankfully, uh, there's one other founder as well who couldn't be here today, but um, the three of us uh, still have the drive and commitment to see things through. And I think if you're starting a business in Japan or wherever else, if you don't have that, you might get the company off the ground, but it's probably just going to falter if you don't want to see it through to the end. Okay, great. I'm glad you mentioned um, vision and COVID-19 because um, one thing I find fascinating is how it seems like for KBC, you had some plans before the pandemic um, that sort of like the current situation accelerated. So could you tell us like briefly how the word or the, I guess the keyword access sort of became a central theme um, in you tackling like the COVID challenges head on, like for instance, like. Yeah, so actually access, interestingly, was a was a theme that we had put in place uh, probably around, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe 2019 or so, um, okay. prior to COVID, actually. Uh, but anyway, at that time, we mainly sold beer in kegs to beer bars, and that was our, that was our main customer base. It was 97, 98% of our sales. Um, so basically, when COVID came, uh, the majority of that uh, market dried up because people had to shut down their bars. They couldn't operate uh, during state of emergencies. Uh, so we had to pivot quite quickly to selling beer in a different format and through different sales channels that we hadn't used before, such as our online shop, which was also thankfully pretty much ready to go by the time COVID really, really sunk its teeth in. 
Um, but yeah, we really had to pivot and change our business plan. And a lot of that business plan was now uh, centered around getting the access to new customers who never had it before or didn't even know that we existed before. Uh, so that was definitely a, an integral part of our business being able to survive, but also a really difficult challenge over the last you know, 16, 18 months. Yeah, like Chris was saying, uh, we had to basically take a hard look at our vision. We had to take a look at our mission. We had to take a look at our core values. And we said, like, what's really good? What's working for us? And what do we got to revisit? And so at that time, like, for example, um, we said that we're going to do everything ourselves. We're going to ship direct. Um, we had to really say, is that realistic? Or um, Japan, where it is now and how it's matured in such a short amount of time, does that rule still make sense? And so we had to kind of take a look across the board of KDC and basically start to rewrite stuff. And we're still doing that right now to this day. So, and speaking of, you know, where Japan is now, um, I think something that a lot of our viewers are wondering is, you know, how is Japan different from the U.S. when it comes to craft beer consumption or, you know, just like what's available in terms of beers? And what are the major changes you've noticed? You know, like many, I would say on the consumer side or just in the industry in general, like what, how has Japan changed in terms of craft beers, right? Because I know for myself, when I first came 10 years ago, you just didn't see this type of craft beer access everywhere, like convenience stores, supermarkets. Like from your side, what, what are some things that you've noticed that, you know, that are very different, um, you know, from the U.S. and Japan? And, and what has changed over the past five to 10 years? Yeah, uh, I think what's happening in Japan is usually maybe a two, two to five year delay on what's happening overseas, especially in the United States, as far as craft beer goes. Um, the U.S. is seeing, uh, it has been for a while, like a second boom uh, interest in craft beer. Uh, definitely started happening in Japan right around the time we we opened up. So <clears throat> uh, 2013-ish, um, yeah, um, a little bit later, 2015, I guess. Um, yeah, so I think as that second boom started, started to happen, uh, it became craft beer kind of was put into, into, into the focus a little bit more. People became more familiar with it. Uh, it, it moved out of just the, the kind of maniac, you know, only for, for geeks sort of realm into normal people's realm, um, which I think made a big difference as far as availability. And then what we found is, as Paul was saying, we're kind of switching our business model and focusing more on, you know, product in cans and through distributors. Uh, distributors are much more aware now that, for example, craft beer for the most part has to be refrigerated all the time. Whereas I would say 10 or 15 years ago, that would have been a non-starter right from the beginning. Um, but we've had a lot more positive reception to the more stringent restrictions that are on our product. Um, positive reception from the distributors and a willingness to be flexible than say what would have happened 10 or 15 years ago, just because that, I guess, popularity or awareness of craft beer is starting to, uh, to increase. Yeah, so uh, like uh, 2004, essentially, when I landed in Japan, there were 272 places. I just looked it up prior to the interview. Um, and then around 2014, when we were getting KBC off the ground, there were 217 places. Is so when we were coming, right? yeah, brewery numbers. And so when we had originally come to Japan, um, craft beer, as people know, craft beer right now did not exist. It was really like regional breweries that were making like German beer that didn't taste very well. And so year after year, you were kind of getting this slide of companies going bankrupt and therefore the number of breweries across the country going down little by little. Um, so like, yeah, around that time, I guess you could say that uh, what the United States had experienced in the early 90s, Japan was experiencing in the early 2000s. So there was about a 10 year gap between what was happening in the US and Canada. But like Chris said, nowadays, um, the kind of difference, I guess you could say between the US and Japan has, has, has narrowed. Mm -hmm. And so nowadays, it's not breweries that are closing, it's breweries that are opening. So like I mentioned earlier, 217 places when KDC got off the ground. And now, um, as of this month, there are now 528 places in Japan. Yeah. So it's more than doubled. So it's really easy. Well, I don't want to say super easy, but it's a lot easier than it used to be, even when we were opening up to get beer, craft beer. If you had... Um... I, hearing about your journeys to become, uh, you know, owners, like founders of KBC, it's quite inspiring. And a, a lot of people are, are you know, watching this uh, may, you know, maybe wondering, like, if you had any sort of, like, words of wisdom <laughs> for them um, in general, like, you know, on, on their journeys, like, to Japan, like, is there anything that you would want to say? Yeah, I mean, I guess just 
some, summarizing my experience here in Japan, I think uh, Ben, Paul, and I, the three founders, really saw this as a way to uh, contribute in a, in a positive way to, to Japanese society. I mean, we've all kind of committed to living the rest of our lives here. Um, so this, this experience kind of going from jet and then through an intermediary, you know, uh, studying and work and then starting our own business has really been something that allows us to, to do what we want to do and the way we want to do it. And hopefully, um, people, you know, react positively to that. So I think that's been one of the most rewarding things that, that we've, uh, experienced so far. Um, so say, yeah, if other people are looking, maybe if they're in jet now, or maybe <clears throat> looking to transition back to Japan. Um, you know, there's definitely opportunities to, to do basically whatever you want if you put your mind uh, to it. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say in closing. Can I just add that that mantra of every situation is different coming from JET program, um, especially with Corona. Um, I imagine there isn't one person out there who hasn't been impacted in some way by either direct uh, or a friend of a friend or whatnot who has gotten Corona. Uh, and it's kind of impressed uh, upon people, um, I guess you could say, our mortality. And what it also means as well is that, you know, with this idea that time is finite, um, it's probably best if you have had an idea in the back of your mind to just go ahead and do it. Um, like, it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're poor, or rich or whatever. If you want to do something, just go ahead and do it. That sounds very corny, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good advice though. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time, um, bright and early. <laughs> um, and I'm looking forward to see what, what else you have in store for us um, in Japan. And, and hopefully we'll try some more pairings together. <laughs> sounds good. It was good talking to you, Mario. Same here. Thank you, Mario, Paul, and Chris. The Japanese beer industry sure has changed a lot. When I was a jet, I had to go all the way to Tokyo to find craft beer. Next up is our final segment with Derek Yamashita of Hidden Japan. Derek will talk about how being placed in rural Japan enabled him to create his own travel company. He will talk a little bit about that, and then we will share a short clip from Hidden Japan about what it's like to do a farm stay in rural Japan. Really, this segment is about how, no matter where you end up being placed as a jet, you're in for an amazing experience and can turn it into something you might never have expected. Hello everyone, my name is Derek Yamashita. I was a jet about five years ago in the countryside of Japan in a region called Yamagata Prefecture. And today what I'd like to talk about is how being placed in rural Japan as opposed to Tokyo or another big city can actually be advantageous to find a job after you finish jet. And so one thing that I did when I was a JET is that I got, to, I got to network my local community and get to know a lot of local people because being in a small area as opposed to being a big city really does help you stand out more. And it actually does help you actually meet people more and form bonds with people. So after people found out that I was departing JET, I got a couple of job offers. I worked for two years in a Japanese company. And through those experiences, I managed to start a travel company called The Hidden Japan here in Yamagata after I finished um, with mm -hmm. my other company. And so one thing I want to emphasize is that the travel industry in Japan is beginning to shift. It's shifting from travel in Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, and it's shifting outwards towards rural Japan, towards the countryside of Japan, to parts of Japan that are not crowded and to places that are off the beaten path. But the challenges as a travel company for me to send tourists to rural Japan is that it's hard to find guides who are knowledgeable in rural Japan who are able to service and create special experiences in rural Japan. But as, as a jet who's placed in the countryside, you do have the opportunity to live in the area, form bonds, and get to know the, the good things that are in your community. So as a travel agent uh, like myself, I think I can think of no better guide than jets who spend many years in their, in their region of rural Japan. You know, they know they know that area better than anyone else, and they're able to be great guides who have personal stories and connections to that region. And also through the Hidden Japan, through my travel company, I've had the chance to travel all around Japan doing travel advisory services, doing photo and video work. I got to travel to Germany about two years ago to represent Japan in the cruise industry. I was able to bring local chefs from Yamagata to my hometown of Los Angeles where we did um, culinary promotional events and we planned to go back after Corona. And so I was able to create a lifestyle and a job that really suits me that I always wanted to do here in Japan. And it's all thanks to being placed in the countryside of Japan. And I encourage you all to um, kind of look out for opportunities and if, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at The Hidden Japan. Thank you so much. It's the hottest time of the year. It's mid-August and even though the sun just set, it's still really, really hot. But anyways, I'm here to show you a very, very special fact about traveling in rural Japan. 
is that you can actually stay at farmer homestays just like this one. This one's called Na. And you can stay with the farmers, enjoy a home-cooked dinner together with the farmers, stay inside a room in their home. And then you can join them early in the morning, about 5 a.m., just, just before the sun uh, rises, go into the fields, harvest crops, and take those crops back to the farmer's homestay, and then cook with the farmers and enjoy a really delicious home-cooked meal. Right. right now we're here with a man named Norimasa. He's the owner of Na, and he'll be um, checking us in and also cooking our dinner. Thank you. And by the way, we're also joined here by two special guests, Charlotte from Chanelian. Hey guys! And also our host for today, our very special host, he's going to be out in the fields with us, and he's going to teach us about Dada to Mami here, uh, Hiro-san. Hi, konnichiwa. These are local vegetables from Tsuroka, and they use uh, local cooking te techniques too, so you can really get a taste for the region you're in. For example, right here, Hiro, can you explain this? I've, I've never had vegetables cooked in this way. Like, what, what, are, what are these? えっと、これはね、えっと、ナスの鍋焼きにナスを味噌で炒めて、で、これにチーズをトッピングしてる。あ、チーズも入ってます。チーズも入ってる。わあ。新しいスタイルですね。I've never, I've never had it like this before. <laughs> and what, what is, I've never even seen, what is this? これはね、ミョウガ。ミョウガ。はい。Okay. So Japanese ingredient. はい。で、隣がポテト。ポテト? Yeah. This is our original recipe, right? I think so. Yeah. I think it tastes like it. So, really, really good um, home-cooked meals here. It's a, one of the rooms is at the farmer homestead. There's about four of these in Na. And as you can see, uh, the bed for tonight is going to be a roll-up futon. And if it's too hard for you, you can request another futon to go under it so it's softer. But overall, the room's pretty big, pretty comfortable. I'd say it's pretty comparable to your Japanese yokan, any, your Japanese inn. Anyways, um, right out the window here, we got a beautiful view of the rice fields, and we're going to wake up at 4 o'clock tomorrow to go out and harvest, so it's about time I go to bed. <laughs> えっと、収穫した田田茶豆をトラクターの後ろのコンテナに乗せて、それを作業場に持っていく。え、そういう作業をしてます。えっと、大体この 1台 all right so now we're at a different farm of Hidakazu and at this farm he's growing a different species of Dalachimame he's going to show us a special technique about how to harvest Dalachimame by hand right now what I do is this. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh my god! Alright, so he just showed me how to harvest the lachamame. So he's saying that we, uh, what's well, my first time doing this, but we, both, we grab it by the stem here, and he says with one, one, one good tug, and we should pull it out. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one. <laughs> Shake out the dirt. Yeah. Pretty nice, and look at this. Look at all the dodo chamami right here. Oh, nice. <laughs> Just like that. Perfect. Let's try one more. Probably three or four. Three or four? One, two, three. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite as fast as you, though. <laughs> Alright. So here's 
our final product. So from the fields to the processing center to the sorting center right here, the packaging, we have some of the highest grade soybeans in all of Japan. The famous Nadalchamame of Suzuoka City. And so from now, these packages are bound from Tokyo. They're bound with some of the highest grade gift shops in all of Japan. But we're going to take this package, take it back to Na, our farmer homestead, and we're going to cook it ourselves. We're back in Nodisan at Na, and he's going to help us cook the Nadalchamame that we harvested. But this, not the farmer homestay is right over there, but right next to his farmer homestay, he has this beautiful cafe. And look out the window right here. Beautiful view of the rice fields. ストレスなく食べれるんで、それが一つのコツと、あとは塩を入れることでまたあの中に塩分が入るので、また美味しく茹で上がるので、この塩はえ結構多くもっと入れてもいいんですけど。で、え、ダダチャマメはできるだけえ